Hode, they must say that misery loves company because this Saturday night, 7.30 p.m., as Arizona State takes on USC, it's two teams that nobody thought would be in the positions that they're in right now. Hi, everybody. Zach Keenan here for DevilsDigest.com alongside our publisher, Hode Rubino. And I would imagine between these two things, these, these two teams, the number one quality must be resiliency. And I'd imagine that I'm right. Yeah, absolutely, Zach. And I think the lack of resiliency is why these two teams have had a much more disappointing season than everybody, anybody thought they actually would. You look at USC and the three losses uh, at home to Pac-12 foes. In each of those games, Zach, going into the fourth quarter, USC was already down 20 or more points at home against their Pac-12 foes. So it's not only digging yourself a hole in the first half that is pretty deep, but coming out at a locker room after halftime, in-game adjustments or lack thereof in the second half, and those have been major, major issues for USC. In two of those games, they scored zero points in the third quarter. And the game that they actually did score points was three points. So this is definitely a USC team that hasn't shown any measure of resiliency at all throughout the season. But look, it's not all peaches and creams here in Tempe when it comes to resiliency and ASU. I think there definitely has shown, uh, the definitely a leadership issue has been shown to be an issue over here. I think maybe it's really more on the players than the coaches. I really think the coaches are trying to push all the right buttons to get that leadership quality more to the forefront. And maybe you can make the argument that they're not pushing all the right buttons. But at the same time, the players have to be accountable not only for what they do in terms of X's and O's, but also those intangibles and leadership or lack thereof is, is one of them. The U UCLA win is by far the most impressive win that ASU had this season, even though you can make the argument that UCLA, after that ASU game, wasn't really uh, being lights out in, the, in, in their play and a slim of a chance that ASU may have to win the South. Uh, that chance is pretty much non-existent with, with UCLA, for example. But you remember, Zach, in that first half against UCLA, every time UCLA scored, ASU scored back. Every punch that UCLA delivered, ASU delivered a punch back, and they showed that uh, they had an answer for er anything that UCLA was throwing at them. They, they, if they, could, they go into halftime with a slim lead. And the se in second half, UCLA has zero, zero resiliency. ASU shuts them out, still plays well, well in offense. And again, they got, which back then was a, ve a very, very impressive win. Like I said, right now, maybe put in context, maybe all, all not that impressive. So that's when ASU showed resiliency. But that game, honestly, looks like a million years ago because you just saw what happened the game going into the bye week against Utah, ASU plays great in the first half. Second half, Utah comes out out of the locker room like gangbusters, and, and sure, they were honoring the, the, the fallen teammates. That game was charged with emotion, but ultimately, ASU has to deliver a counter punch to all those punches that, that, that your opponent is, is delivering. Then you have coming a, a game uh, last week, uh, coming out of the bye week against Washington State. And look, you don't want to have turnovers, but you especially don't want to have turnovers that early in the game like ASU had, first three drives, uh, all, all, all them result, resulting in turnovers, but okay. That happened. What are you going to do about it? And that lack of re lack of resiliency, which I think is tied very closely to lack of leadership, has really hurt ASU quite a bit against Utah. Obviously, more in the second half than the first half, and the entire game against against Washington State. So, the resiliency factor is not that great with USC, but it's definitely not great not not great for ASU. And I have no doubt in my mind that the leadership and the resiliency and the perseverance, if you will, for ASU has to show up uh, this Saturday if they have any chance of beating USC. Now we'll start our preview with the USC offense. And with one minor exception last week, USC has not had any trouble beating up and preying on some of the worst teams that it's played on the schedule. The issues are against the stiffer competition, those tougher teams. That's who USC has been having a really difficult time against. And we'll get more about that game last week. We'll touch more on that later. But as far as the offense goes, we, we haven't even touched on the fact that this quarterback room is a total mess. Yeah, quarterback quarter was a total mess, but I think uh, maybe – not an elephant in the room, but definitely a fresh, significant, adverse news for the Trojans. Drake London, not only the best wide receiver in the Pac-12, I would argue the best wide, uh, wide receiver in all, all, all of college football, uh, did suffer a season-ending injury last Saturday against, against Arizona. And here's the thing. Anybody that uh, covers USC, that follows USC, knows that all season long, when USC plays, no matter who it is, whether it's Notre Dame, a Pac-12 foe, whatever, 
that defense is keyed on Drake London. I mean, I don't know how many snaps in any given game Drake London saw anything less than double coverage and probably saw triple coverage sometimes. But those wide receivers around them, which have no pressure on them whatsoever, which are not getting nearly tight the coverage that Drake, that Drake London is get, getting on, the, on any given snap, are not able to do anything with it. So now the question is, okay, well, we, when you didn't have pressure, when you had that mother of all safety valves in Drake London, and you, and you as a number two, number three, number four wide receiver on the USC roster, not able to do a whole lot with it, what are you going to do now in the first game where Drake Linden is not playing when that news is still fresh in your mind and you're, just, you're still trying to process it and trying to figure out how you're going to deal with this major, major ad adverse component? Uh, that that's, a, you know, that's a big question, which really I think is going to be the key for how well or how poorly USC may or may not play uh, this, uh, this Saturday against, against ASU. And it's funny because you, you, look, you look at the numbers and USC is still – the leading overall offensive team in the Pac-12, even though they're a four and four record, uh, they are the leading passing uh, offense in the in the, in the Pac-12. Um, the running game is uh, is somewhat middle of the road, and the running game is something kind of interesting because I'm seeing some parallels between them and Washington State, where USC was definitely an offense that uh, was much more better in the air than they were on the ground. But their Texas transfer running back uh, Kante Ingram, the last three games, 342 yards and scoring three touchdowns. Yes, one of those games was against Arizona, so maybe take it with a grain of salt. But the other game was against uh, against Notre Dame. So now you're wondering if you're seeing, uh, and and obviously with the loss of Drake London, that becomes even a more important issue. Can you see this USC running game uh, that is showing definitely some flashes the last couple of weeks revive itself even more against uh, against a team like ASU? Uh, that's something that's definitely going to be interesting to see. Now let's talk about the quarterback controversy. Jackson Dart is not only the best backup quarterback in the Pac-12, but if you had to make a list of the best backup quarterbacks in all of college football, he easily makes the top 10, maybe even the top five. Ironically, Jackson Dart has only played in two games, and, and, and he is a true freshman, obviously. And he did play very, very well against against Washington State early, early in the season, so, uh, passed for four touchdowns, had, had just done under 400 yards passing, suffered uh, a very serious injury where Dante Williams, the interim head coach for USC, and the coaching staff for, uh, as a whole for that matter, they knew he wasn't going to be available for the next game the week after that. But for some reason, they thought, let's go ahead and keep it a secret. Let's get this fan base even more excited about this young, up-and-coming quarterback, and let's try to turn, by default, the fan base even more against, against Keaton Slovis. Now, look, when, it, when you talk about Slovis, he had a great game against ASU in the season opener in 2020. He did not play well the rest of the way. He ended that 2020 season, as weird as that campaign was, on a very, very down note. And Jackson Dart is, is somebody that's really breathing down Keaton Slovens' neck ever since he arrived in, in L.A. Back in, back, in, back in the spring. So now you have a fan base that was actually cheering much more loudly for Dart than they were for Slovis when Dart was playing in, his in only his second game of the season against U of A. That was a game where the coaching staff had a pre-made approach, if you will, to come hell or high water, we're going to play Jackson Dart X amount of series. So the confidence for Keaton Slovis cannot be good at all. Um, he, you know, he's definitely going to start against ASU, but your guess is as good as mine. Is he going to finish that game? Is he going to play each and every snap against the Sun Devil defense? <laughs> that is something that is way, way up in the air. And I think maybe one factor that maybe not a lot of folks are talking about, ultimately, Jackson Dart is a true freshman. He played in two games. Now, do you want to preserve his redshirt year? Do you, as an interim USC head coach, that you know you're not going to be part of the staff in, in 2022, do you even care about redshirting him or, or, or not? I mean, that, that's, a, you know, that, that, that's another question because if Jackson Dart does play in all the remaining games for USC uh, th this year, even if they don't make it to a bowl game, he's going to burn that redshirt. So that's another aspect that makes you wonder, is Jackson Dart going to see more playing time? Because he, he definitely did play well against Arizona last week, and, and, and so did uh, Keaton Slovis for that matter. But if you're the ASU defense, well, what is your approach with this game? But without Drake London, you definitely have to dare that USC passing game uh, to, to beat you. And as I mentioned about Keontae Ingram and the, and the running game for USC, I, I think that it behooves you anyway to really crowd the line of scrimmage as, as, as much as possible. Don't let that running game take, uh, take that extra step after playing pretty well in back-to-back -back weeks uh, le le uh, leading up to this game. 
And especially if you have somebody like Jackson Dart taking snaps from center, yes, he's a very talented signal caller. He's still a true freshman. He's still only a, a quarterback that played in two games. I like to think that the caliber of this ASU defense can really confuse him, can really, can, can really pressure him uh, quite a bit, and really derail a USC passing game, which, as I mentioned, is hurting badly right now without the services of Drake London. Oh, and I believe we watched that game, seeing that Jackson Dart game from Provo, actually. We were getting burgers for lunch somewhere, <laughs> and I just remember watching with uh, uh, just amusement seeing Jackson Dart, a true freshman, lighted up against mm -hmm. a formidable defense. Speaking of defenses, we'll shift to USC's defense, and it's one where it's not great. <laughs> in, in each of their three Pac-12 losses, they've surrendered more than 40 points. And ironically enough, all three of those losses have been at home at the LA Coliseum. So not where they'll be this weekend, but they're giving up a lot of points at home. And I promised, as, we, as I promised, last weekend against U of A, oh my goodness, they came so close to a fourth Pac-12 team putting up 40 points against them. I know ASU's offense has been struggling so much recently, but maybe this is what the doctor ordered? You, you, you would hope so, Zach. You would hope so. Because make no mistake about it, USC has plenty of issues on offense. And we just detailed them a second ago. But the, the problem for this Trojan team in 2021, it's its, it, it's, it's its defense, bar none. Like you said, that is just an absolute pitiful performance that this side of the ball has displayed, or really didn't display, I should say, in their four Pac-12 home games uh, this, this year. And it's funny because you look at the stats, they're middle of the pack when it comes to run defense. They're middle of the pack when it, when it comes to pass defense. But points per game as a defensive unit, next to last in the Pac-12 with, with, with over 28 points. This wasn't a unit that anybody thought was, was going to be a juggernaut coming into the 2021 season, but I don't think anybody in the wildest streams thought they, re they re really would play that poorly. Um, you know, as, they, as the cliche goes with the defense, it always starts with uh, what you have or don't have up front. And they've had major injuries, surprise transfers in, 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 in their defensive line that really has just had an adverse effect, a trickle-down adverse effect, I should say, for, uh, for, the, for the rest of that unit. Uh, it's not a team that really, really able to put a lot of pressure on the quarterback, not really that great uh, stopping, stopping the run. So, yes, I mean, I like to think that ASU – could uh, you know could bounce back against one of the poorest defenses in in, in the Pac-12, and when you talk about what what Arizona did, I mean yes they lost that game. They still scored 34 points in in the LA Coliseum, a winless Arizona team, not only this year but even dating back to last year. And look, any ASU coach or player will tell you, of course, we're light years better as an offense than the University of Arizona. We showed it just last year, beating them in Tucson 17-7, and look what we did and then the Wildcats have done in, in, in 2021. Okay, great. You know what? So the 34 points that U of A scored, the 300, I believe, 49 passing yards that, that, um, that U of A was able to post, the 122 rushing yards besides five sacks that the Wildcats were able to tally, that shouldn't be your standard if you're an ASU offense. That should be your floor. I mean, again, if you think you are significantly better than, uh, than this U of A offense, great. Show it, okay? This is what this offense did just last Saturday to, 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 to this USC defense, a group which, again, this wasn't an operation, as you mentioned a second ago. They've, they've been giving up points in the bushel for, mo for most of the Pac-12 teams. Can you, the ASU offense, who scored, by the way, only 21 points really the last three games because it's even the Stanford victory, there only, only were 21 points scored by, by, by the Sun Devil offense. Is this a game that's really going gonna, gonna to reignite your, your, your explosiveness, really show us maybe an offense that we saw really against UCLA, for example, rather than what we saw the last three games? Uh, that, 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 that remains a big question mark. I think that the possible return of Rashad White to, to, to the ASU running game uh, really helps, as I mentioned all year long, the bread and butter of, of, of this ASU offense because I definitely have my doubts of this passing game leading the charge uh, for the Sun Devils. I know it happened against UCLA, but, but it, when you look at the grand scheme of things, that really was an aberration. If this running game can play well with three healthy running backs and really take the pressure off, off the passing game, maybe then we, we can see an ASU team, much like their in-state rival, just, just post 30-some uh, th th points on the USC and, and, and pass them and, and pass forward for 300 yards. The opportunity is, is absolutely there. But you, know, you and I were talking here back in September, and we're talking about a Southern Utah team, a UNLV team, a BYU team, 
that came into their matchups with the Sun Devils with a secondary that had zero confidence, that was getting light up for 300 some yards the week prior to the ASU game, and this passing offense was simply not able to take advantage of it. So part of me is skeptical, can, can, can this ASU offense really take, uh, uh, take advantage of a USC secondary, which yes, they're coming off a victory, but you can't tell me that those film sessions in LA this year, when it comes to the safeties and cornerbacks, were, were a pleasant experience. When you have a winless U of A team, did did, did what they did to you in in, in the air. So, uh, it's definitely an opportunity for the ASU offense to get uh, to get back on track and and really to light up the stat sheet and more importantly, uh, come uh, come come away with the win. But I, I, I definitely do have my doubts. But at the same time, as much as I talk about the passing game opportunity, there's no doubt in my mind that if this ASU running game is not going to kick it to the next gear, is not going to play the quote unquote normal ASU, ASU ground attack, and, and if Rashad White's going to line up, there's no reason for that not to happen. Um, I really don't see this offense being all that successful, even against a horrible USC defense. Hode, I for one know that I would enjoy some more highlight plays for our intro video to these packages as much as I enjoy the uh, the, the, the pick and flip or the Rashad White uh, trick play touchdown. It's, it's, it's time for some new highlight shots for that intro video. This will actually be the first time this year that ASU will open with odds at home against a Pac-12 opponent that aren't double digits now of course it is the line just below 10 ASU of course favored but Hode with that in mind do you foresee this being maybe a close contest and one that ASU could pull out ahead and avoid back-to-back -back losses this year yeah I mean it's really hard for me to look at this game as a potential blowout win for for for, for Arizona State the offense as we mentioned struggled the defense has hasn't been kind of up up and down although when you talk about the resiliency factor that we talked earlier in this piece I think the US the the ASU defense did show some resiliency with the way they played against Washington State in the second half they did not allow any touchdowns allowed them allowed only two field goals and gave the offense some kind of chance to uh, to uh, to rebound but but really, I think uh, the, the the small line, even with the news about Drake London, which uh, is really surprising in, in, in a bad way, uh, I think is really much more about the ineffect ineffectiveness of this of, of this AS, ASU offense, and it's really not it's really not you trying to nitpick uh, to find reasons why this ASU t ASU team is isn't doing well. You just look and you see and you see what ASU the ASU offense has done in, in, in the last in the last three games. Even though they're facing a horrible USC defense, I don't think we have really any confidence that, that ASU is going to be able to, to, walk, to walk all all over them. I think they I think the ASU defense is is able to play uh, well enough to to shut down a USC offense, which again now we're dealing with the new reality of, of not not playing with somebody like, somebody like Drake London. And look, this game, needless to say, is a big time revenge game. We we know what happened in the, in the 2020 season opener. Much of that was because of Drake London, a wide receiver that now ASU is not going to have to face. This is definitely going to be a gut check uh, a, a, a gut check uh, game. You and I are on the message boards every day. We we know what the ASU fans feel. I did a podcast where I where I had to cut down uh, the number of questions from like 60 to 30 from it from ASU fans, and those questions weren't so much just inquiries about the state of the Sun Devils or really just really more one damning statement after another after another. So there are plenty of complaints right now against ASU, and the only way to change that narrative is, is to win against USC. I don't think it's going to be a convincing win, but I also like to think that this is an ASU team that, unlike 2019, when they were at 5-1, and one, lost to Utah, and that was the beginning of a four-game skid. I don't think we're going to see that scenario in, in Tempe in, in, in 2021. And this is going to be a game that, again, it's going to be much closer with what the odd makers are, are thinking. So I'm predicting ASU to beat USC 30 to 24. It's actually a doubleheader against USC, the men's and women's swim team competing against the Trojans at the Monal Plumber Aquatic Center just across from Sun Devil Stadium. That'll be at noon and then later at 7.30 p.m. ASU looking to avoid consecutive losses. That's something that they need to do, Hode, if they have any chance at winning out the season. It starts with a win on Saturday. In the meantime, for all your pregame content, make sure you keep it locked in to DevilsDigest.com. And if you haven't already, give us a follow on Twitter at DevilsDigest. For Hoderbino, I'm Zach Keenan. We'll see you Saturday.